This week on The Green Building Show, we continue our investigation into the energy efficient home. I sit down with Steve King, a senior lecturer at the University of New South Wales, and he's going to explain what it really takes to get an energy efficient home and the key drivers and key contributors to energy efficiency within the home. And in this week's Australian Style, we kick off our tropical housing series. I'll speak with award winning architect Peter Pierce, who's designed a lightweight and innovative treehouse on the slopes of Mount Whitman in Cairns. We'll also hear from Victoria Lee, who's got a quirky and fashionable take on green jewellery. And for this week's You Asked Us, we'll be focusing on solar. And I speak with industry expert Jed McCarthy, who's going to help us answer your questions. I'm here today with Steve King, he's a senior lecturer of architecture at the University of New South Wales. Thanks for being with us, Steve. No problem. We're talking today about the energy efficient home. So can you give us a rundown of some of the general principles uh, that go into energy efficiency? Okay, I mean the first thing to understand is that um, these days in a place like Sydney or New South Wales more generally, um, the energy efficiency of a family home is now not dominated by heating and cooling anymore. It's dominated by your appliances and by your hot water use and by a couple of other things that are actually, potentially, affecting your energy bills more than your heating and cooling. Okay? But nevertheless, um, it's good to start with a dwelling that is energy efficient uh, in the sense of requiring as little water uh, for artificial heating and cooling as possible. Okay, okay. And, and talking about dwellings, I think you, you've written previously that not all components in a, in a home contribute the same to yeah. energy efficiency use. So what is, in your opinion, the, the biggest contributor okay. to energy efficiency in a home? I mean, the two things are the roof, because it's simply the biggest surface exposed to the elements the most. Okay? Everything else you can shelter to some extent, but the roof is not sheltered by anything. So um, the first thing is to make sure that your roof is adequately insulated and preferably a light colour. Um, why it should be a light colour is, is really interesting. I mean, everybody, I think, understands that a lighter colour roof reflects more sun in summer and therefore stays cooler. And in our sorts of climates, that's supremely important. That cuts down your air conditioning costs potentially by down to a third, okay? Comparing uh, light, very light coloured roofs with very dark coloured roofs. The second, and the one that remains even after you do the best possible job on uh, roofs is glass. So your windows and doors. And I can say with great certainty that um, the weak point, especially in individually designed dwellings, whether they are houses or apartments, is that they're overglazed. Um, it's, it's almost as simple as that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess you, you, you've written um, previously also that glazing um, is, can measure disproportionately the amount of thermal and energy ratings. So what, what can someone do about that? What are, well, what are the pitfalls and what are the solutions? I mean, if you're doing new build, don't be greedy with your amount of glazing. You, there's a temptation to just throw a lot of uh, glass at a good view, okay? But in reality, you can manage that view uh, more effectively if you're conscious of the fact that there's that rather less glass is better for you than, than too much glass. The reason why that's so is because glass is highly conductive and it's just a little thin skin between you and the outside. Every other element of the house, the wall, the roof, and whatever, there's space to stick insulation into it. So a simple rule of thumb is that you lose 10 times as much heat in winter through a, a, a square metre of grazing as you do through a square metre of the wall next to it. Okay, so it makes it very simple. Optimise the areas of grazing, preferably reduce them. If you look at the kinds of houses they build in Europe, uh, especially the cold climates of Europe, and the kinds of houses we build here in Sydney, um, you can see it immediately. They've got much smaller windows and doors, uh, glass doors. If you compare project homes to architect designed homes in here in Sydney, you see that the project homes have it down pretty tight. You know, they've got glazing ratios maximum 20% or very, very low 20s. Mm -hmm. Architect designed houses can go to 100% of their floor area uh, in glass. Now you can imagine what's, what's so, how much easier it is to make uh, a house with 20% of its wall area or 20% ratio to the floor uh, 
well insulated than it is the one that's overgrazed. Okay, so having said that, um, good window treatments go a long way towards uh, reducing the, the penalty that's associated with overglazing. Um, so good heavy curtains with helmets, good quality blinds, um, and actually using them instead of leaving them open on cold winter nights or, or leaving them open on, on, on hot days um, can improve the performance of that, um, that glazing uh, tremendously. So simple principles like if you're trying to keep the sun out, use reflective colours and reflective surfaces. Um, if you're trying to stop losing heat or gaining heat um, by what's called conduction, in other words, from warm air outside to whatever temperature you're trying to mm -hmm. keep inside or vice versa, you're trying to keep warm inside, it's cold outside, then insulation is your friend. Okay, okay and what about um, thermal mass? I mean, a, lot ah. of people, a lot of people think thermal mass, you need high thermal mass to have an energy efficient house. However, there's, a, there's been a few studies which, which say that's a misconception. What, what's your take? No, it's not entirely a misconception, but I like to put it as it's not so much maximum thermal mass or high thermal mass that you're interested in, it's the right amount of thermal mass that, that's of interest, okay? Basically, if you're trying to run the house in what's called passive mode, in other words, not have any artificial cooling or not have any artificial heating in summer, you have no choice. You have to have some thermal mass. Okay? Think about it in terms of winter. If you have free solar heating, in other words, your orientation is good, you've been able to put glass in the right directions and you're actually getting useful sun in, so it's free. Then thermal mass is where you absorb that heat so that it carries you over into the evening when you need the extra heating. If you don't have the thermal mass, all that's going to happen is that you overheat instantly in response to that sun, and you have to open your windows to get rid of that heat. Okay, so where's the most important place to have thermal mass? Is it the walls or the slab? Uh, Always start with the floor, because that's the most convenient place to put it. Usually putting it in the wall, especially in a climate like Sydney's, is overdoing it unless you have lots of free solar heating. The only, play, only time when it becomes beneficial to keep increasing that thermal mass is actually for summer cooling. Okay. Because, again, think about it. Shading, all it does is it reduces the load of the sun shining on your house or shining through your windows. It doesn't lower your temperatures. The only way you can actually get cooling, in other words, to end up cooler at the periods of the day, um, is to be able to absorb the heat into something, thermal mass. And then when it cools down outside, open your windows and ventilate and get rid of that heat, right? So it's thermal mass that's acting like the, the flywheel. But again, you, have to, you have, to have, have to have the right quantity. I keep emphasizing that because if you put too much thermal mass in a building that has, for instance, no free sun in winter, then when you try to artificially heat that building, then you're going to have to heat the thermal mass as well. In other words, you're wasting heating by heating up the house rather than heating up the air in it and the occupants in it. Right? So if you have an unfavorably oriented site, or if you have a house that simply cannot get enough free sun, then thermal mass, you have to be very, very careful about how much you put in, and you usually balance up that summer performance with that, that desired winter performance. You need a little, certainly, to help you in summer, but under certain circumstances, it's actually best to have completely lightweight building because you're relying on artificial heating alone. Stephen King, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. So Vic, green jewellery, what's it all about? Yes, um, well last week we talked about green living furniture um, and I just saw a great post on news.com.au this morning about living jewellery. Um, an Icelandic designer, his name is Hafstein Juliusen, has created these really funky, beautiful rings that have um, moss inside them and you water them once every five weeks. They've got these really kind of cool, chunky designs, single ring or a whole knuckle duster. Um, for both men and women. So they're kind of fabulous. Um, looked around the web a little bit and there's this really gorgeous one from um, a Canadian designer called Alison Wells of Paper Snake that again will grow if you water it. And then this really lovely uh, idea from an American designer, Colleen Jordan. So she wrote a thesis on, um, on whether you can make 
plastic green because it can last as long as gold, it can last forever, so is there any way to make it kind of beautiful? And she's just come up with these wearable planter ideas, which is plastic, a necklace, and it just has um, a plant inside. Just an interesting idea of looking at different materials and seeing, questioning what is eco-friendly and what's not. Okay, well I'm here today with Peter Pierce of MMP Architects in Cairns. This is a firm that's taken out this year's Australian Institute of Architects House of the Year Award for Far North Queensland. Thanks for being with us, Peter. You're welcome. Well, the, in regards to this award, the judges have said your entry, um, the HP Treehouse, is a low. They've said it's a low-budget home with a simple, elegant, and unpretentious form. It has a minimum impact on the site, uses sustainable strategies, and is low maintenance. So I guess we know what the judges think. Um, can you tell us what, why you thought it, it, it won and really stood out against the other finalists? I guess it was, uh, it was a simple and elegant solution for the site. We set out to create something that um, did have a low impact, was comfortable to live in in all conditions with minimal use of, of electricity. OK, great. And, and when the judges are saying you use sustainable strategies, can you um, elaborate on what those sustainable strategies actually were? OK, well, we tried to use sustainable materials as, as much as was possible on the site, including a lot of uh, re sustainable timber resources for, for floor and framing, um, some roof framing. Mm -hmm. where we did use some steel out of necessity. Um, the steel is um, left in a natural galvanised state, so it needs no maintenance. What part did lightweight materials play in in creating a home that's that's both aesthetically appealing and cost effective and sustainable? Okay, we used uh, lightweight materials uh, throughout the home, and including including use of um, fibre cement sheet in um, in a number of areas, very stable and durable long term material, and with uh, with very good sustainability credentials. And I guess can you just elaborate a little bit more as to what what makes this home so um, or what makes this home sustainable? It uh, is essentially designed to be um, occupied, to say, in pretty much all weather conditions and all seasons without, um, there's no heating installed for winter, which is not necessarily generally here in Cairns, and in summer it's cooled by um, a system of breezeways and opening windows that control cross-ventilation, minimal sun penetration, um, which is very important here in the, in the far north. Most of the year we are trying to keep heat out, not to keep heat in, and it's very effective for that. We've used basically LED lighting throughout, minimum power consumption, and we have installed photovoltaic system on the roof to um, minimise our uh, energy that we take off the grid. And how did you minimise the impact on the block? The only earthworks we've done was to park vehicles at the building. Minimum other uh, excavation, the building sits above the natural slope. We've left the natural contour and as much of the natural vegetation in place as possible. Fantastic. Well, congratulations on your win and thanks for your time, Peter. Thanks, Carlos. This week, we have a question from Caroline, and she's looking for the best way to get her neighbours and neighbourhood excited for installing solar. To help me answer this, I speak with Jed McCarthy, an industry expert in solar, who's got plenty to say on the topic. Well, I'm here today with Jed McCarthy. He's the founder of the Australian Renewable Energy Consumer Alliance. Thanks for being with us, Jed. No worries. We've, we've, we've had a question from one of our readers, and they're trying to find out what's a, what's a great way to get their, their neighbours excited for for installing solar. So I guess, can you give us a bit of a rundown for the business case for solar? I mean, what, what incentives are there for homeowners to to um, to come up with some of these upfront costs and, and, and get, get solar in their homes? Yeah, no worries at all. The best way, I think the best way to get people excited about solar power is to get them to have a look at their power bill every every quarter when it comes in. Uh, we've all seen the rising costs of, of power. Um, and solar power is a great way of reducing that cost. Yes, there is an upfront cost for solar power, but the thing is, any power that's produced by solar is a fixed price, uh, so it's it's not going to rise over the, over the time. Um, the incentives for solar, there is a, a, a an incentive that the federal government's put in place, which is a solar credit. So what that entails is certificates are created depending on the size of the system you install, and those certificates are on sold um, for 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 a monetary value, it rises and falls depending on what the market value is. But there's there's a 
can be a few thousand dollars involved in getting in, 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 in the, the, the money that you get back off that. All right, fantastic. And what kind of hardware does, does the average household need to, to, to get solar up and running on their home? I mean, for, say, an average household of, of four people, a couple and, and two kids, what kind of kilowattage um, system are they, are they looking at? Well, the, it is hard to say because every household is different. They, every household lives in a different manner. Um, the basic system that majority of people put in starts at a one and a half kilowatt system. Now that won't that won't cover your household usage for for the average house. You would probably be looking somewhere around the three kilowatt system to actually cover the majority of your usage. Okay, great. The and problem problem we've got at the moment is because of those feed-in tariffs that are low. It, it is it, it, it's a catch twenty two situation now. Do you put a big system in that 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 covers that, um, or it is probably best at the moment to put a smaller system in with an upgradable inverter, so if we do get these feed-in tariffs to increase, you can then put some more solar on at a later yep. date. Great. And, and for, for a 1.5 kilowatt, say, what kind of costs um, would a homeowner be looking at? You'd probably be looking out of pocket. For a decent for a decent system, you'd probably be looking somewhere around the $2,000 mark out of pocket, $2,000, $2,500. Um, so that gives you, that probably gives you about a four to five year payback um, on that system, and then it's, it's basically providing you free power. Greg McCarthy, thank you for your time. No worries at all.